Hello, good evening. Welcome to um, tonight's event with um, Majid Majid and his book, The Art of Disruption, A Manifesto for Real Change. My name is Alice and I work for Writing on the, on the Wall and I'll be hosting tonight's event. Uh, this event is part of our Black History Month Festival and we still have our last few events as part of the festival on this week. So please check out wowfest.uk for more information. Um, just to highlight, um, a few events. Tomorrow at 7pm we have Sophie Williams talking about her book How to Be an Anti-Racist Ally. Um, on Wednesday the Goddess Project um, will have their book club. On Thursday we launch our SS Orbiter to Orbital book um, all about the Windrush generation's impact on British music um, and we'll be joined by Michael Riley as well. And on Friday we have Claire Hooken with our final story time event. Um, all our, our events are free and streamed live on Facebook. We're also accepting do donations as well. Uh, I'd like to give um, a quick mention to our funders, Arts Council England, uh, Liverpool City Council and the Mayor's Fund. And this is part of a wider programme with um, creative organisations um, of Liverpool. If you have any questions for Majid, um, comment down below in the stream and we'll pick them up throughout our conversation. So Majid came to Sheffield from Somalia as a refugee age five. He is the youngest and first refugee and first Green Lord Mayor of Sheffield. And he also became an MEP for the Green Party in May 2019. He's campaigned on issues such as climate change, support for migrants and refugees. He set up the first UK suicide prevention charter and oh even God. banned Donald Trump from Sheffield. Um, his book, uh, The Art of Disruption, is a guide to being courageous and community minded and um, to disrupting and dismantling age old power structures in work, life and politics. Um, hello, Majid. Hello, Alice. Thank you so much for that uh, really lovely and warm introduction. It's, it's a real joy to be with you today. That's brilliant. Um, before we get into our conversation, um, you've got a bit of a reading from the book, so I'll let you do that and then we'll catch up afterwards. Brilliant. Thank you so much for everyone that's um, tuned in. So yeah, so the book is called um, The Art of Disruption, A Manifesto for Real Change, and it's based around 10 key um, themes. So I'll just read from two chapters. Um, one of the chapters being do it differently. And I guess it's been a philosophy that I've always, um, I guess really kind of stood by, especially in, in the line of politics. And I've always had a lot of people ask me, oh, Majid, what, what can I do? Like, or I don't know what it is that I can really do. or I don't know how much of a difference it would make. So I guess this um, part of the uh, chapter kind of addresses that. Every single one of us has some form of platform some degree of influence. Speaking truth to power and acting according uh, to our capabilities and opportunity, whatever that may be, is our collective responsibility. Within the fight for a better world, there is space for every one of us to help make that a reality with an activism fueled by compassion in charity, politics or protest. We can do things differently. Doing things differently can be scary and there are people who will hate you for it. But there are also people who will love you for it and want to join you. You might even change the world in small ways or large ways or spark others to do so. But if you keep doing things how they've always been done and sticking to outdated traditions, you risk never knowing what it's like to succeed. So let us make a promise to not denigrate but to inspire. Rather than bemoan the present, let's paint a picture of what might be. Instead of inciting hatred and instilling fear, let's rise above the chorus of our age. Um, sorry, let's rise above the chorus of our age and dare to sing a different song. So that's basically um, a bit on that. Um, what I'll do is I'll read a bit from the last chapter, which I guess um, it's a bit more relevant in terms of like the current climate and things that we're in at the moment. And it's kind of it's a bit of a call to arms at the same time. My past couple of years as an activist and politician have shown me that there is always hope, even in the most obscure of places. And courage is contagious. Don't ever underestimate the impact that you can have on others. 
Every time that you take a stand, challenge the status quo, or do things differently, not only will your hope take a life of its own, but you will always excite and empower those around you. But standing up takes energy, and we all need coping mechanisms to help us see the hope, whether that may be yoga, praying, or drawing. For me, despite what my dentist or my waistline tells me, that mechanism is cake. Any cake will do. And my favorite being a hot flapjack and lots of custard. If you can provide such a delicious treat for a friend in, in, in need, I can't imagine it would go unappreciated. Most importantly, you need compassion. It should be at the heart of everything we do. Yes, we are living through difficult times and we may encounter events and people that infuriate us, but we need to be strong, be understanding, work collaboratively, and most importantly of all, show, show compassion, the ultimate manifestation of strength. It's all well and good me writing this book as someone who's achieved what I have, but I'm not arrogant enough to think that I did it by myself. And I'd be lying if I said I achieved it through hard work alone, as we all know hard work alone doesn't get you far enough. If I had a question, and uh, if I had an equation, it would be hard work plus sacrifice, plus courage, plus opportunity, plus a bit of shit throwing, which will, be, which will uh, equate to achieving your goals. My success is much about uh, other people, including you, the readers and everybody else, as it is about me. Had it not been for my mother who sacrificed everything for me, the friends who grounded me, the people who voted for me and the countless strangers who have shown me unwavering support, this story would not have been told. And yes, my story is inspiring, I get that, but what does it inspire you to do? If we want our local people to engage in politics and trust their politicians, they need to start seeing themselves in their representatives. We need unapologetic working class voices, but also voices from diverse backgrounds, ethnicities and genders. To see an authentic representation of yourself among your political representatives is incredibly empowering. For transformative change to be possible, politics needs to move away from upper and middle class white men in suits who claim to work for ordinary people. We also need to use our platform to highlight injustices and raise awarenesses around issues that matter. That's our duty as public servants. You don't have to have a fancy title like a Lord Mayor or an MEP to bring about the positive change that you want to see. A lot of people who inspire me don't or aren't politicians. Find out what you're good at and don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. If you're a writer, try get something published. If you're funny, try stand-up comedy. If you're angry with the status quo and are good at encouraging people to join a cause you believe in, stand for election. If you love technology, think of ways you can use it to engage people. We have to win the cultural struggle as well as the political struggle, either by being elected or by changing the minds of those who have been. This year, I've witnessed a lot of people saying that their situation is hopeless, saying things like, this government isn't listening, we can't win, I'm giving up. But that's exactly what they want us to believe and do. We can't afford to enter into a state of despair. Despair is not an option for me, for you, for all our loved ones, or for the future of our planet. The problems we face didn't just come down from the heavens. They are made by bad human decisions, mainly by men in suits. Good human decisions can change everything for the better. As powerful as the elites and corporations are, when we stand up and refuse to be divided, not only will they not stop us, but there's nothing we can't achieve. The recent global events have transformed what is politically possible. The coronavirus has exposed not only the deep inequality within our society, but also has proven what many progressives have been arguing for years. We are only as secure as the most vulnerable amongst us. Any argument to the contrary has fallen apart. For years, we were told that the government was trying really hard, but that it just wasn't possible to house all homeless people. Then the pandemic hit and they housed the homeless. For years, we were told that the government couldn't borrow beyond a certain point. Then the pandemic hit and they borrowed record amounts. These are just two examples of many. Every time that we were told certain things couldn't be done, we were being lied to. It was complete bollocks. We must use this knowledge and confront governments with it. It was never a question of economics. It has always been a question of political will. We all have to reconsider what's possible and be more ambitious and demand more. Perspective can change everything. As scary, painful and depressing as 2020 has been so far, it can also be an opportunity that enables us to grow and see the change that we desperately need. So rather than accepting this year to be a complete shit show and nothing more, it could prove to be the most important year of all. And it's all up to us to make this happen. But transformative change is not spontaneous. 
It requires people to come together and think of ways to improve the lives of ordinary people through dignity, humanity, and universality. It is our time to step up, answer the urgent question of our time, and build the futures that work for both people and our planets. And in these tasks, you'll find me by your side. You've got this. So that's that. <laughs> um, absolutely fantastic. Um, I just thought uh, the book is incredible and it's just such a breath of fresh air. And, you know, people are wanting some compassion within the world of politics right now. And it's just beautifully written. So um, definitely recommend you mm -hmm. Uh, everyone buying a copy at their independent bookshops, News From Nowhere, um, based in Liverpool. So definitely buy yourself a copy. Um, I'd like to start at the beginning and talk about you growing up in, uh, growing up in Sheffield and having, um, you know, your first few years in Somalia. How do you, how do you think those two places shaped your journey into politics and activism? Yes, yeah, so um, there, was a, there was a civil conflict, civil war happened in Somalia, and we could have really ended up anywhere in the world. Mm. It happened to be that we arrived in Sheffield, and for those that don't know, Sheffield is the first city of sanctuary in the UK. So it's got a very long, rich history in welcoming people from all, all across the world, like Liverpool, like so many other places around the country. So we just kind of ended up coming to Sheffield, and of course couldn't speak a word of English or anything like that. But I guess when you're young, you really pick up the language so much more quicker than you than and um, adults would so for me it was just a case of playing out quite a lot but also taking on extra responsibilities that other children my age wouldn't do like translating interpreting filling out forms for my mom and so it was but like thankfully it was it was it, we had a lot of support in Sheffield and if, if I'm being honest with you we were super super grateful and for it so yeah, I guess it was a um, difficult transition. I remember the day we actually came to Sheffield. I remember it was a very rainy day. And it took me a while to kind of realise that was the default setting for this part of the world. <laughs> yeah. It was it, it was amazing, uh, to be honest. And I, of course, like many other like communities up and down the country, and that I've like, I grew up in a community called Burn Grieve and Sheffield, which is a socially deprived community. And it's got its own different challenges and in itself but um yeah it was challenging but it's like yeah Sheffield's basically being home and then thankfully I can still speak Somali fluently and my mum made a good job of um so speaking it at speaking it at home so as much as I can't remember much of Somali I, and I've not actually visited back and I've always been intending to I intended to go this year but then the virus and stuff kind of happens yeah. so it's possible um as, as something would, it would be really interesting for you to talk about is you know why you turned to politics you say like 2014 was kind of um an important year for you when you when that turning point happened for you yeah. um and like you mentioned in the book as well like you you were doing a degree in aquatic zoology you, you were traveling loads you had all different kinds of jobs and um i yeah just talk a little bit about 2014 for you <laughs> yes yeah, so it was it was during the rise of UKIP and Nigel Farage at the European elections and I just remember thinking to myself with everything that's happening I just thought if I can at least make my small part of the world my chef my community that'd be better it's at least me doing something because I felt completely hopeless and like surely there's something I could do and I just thought anything to just stop moaning and complaining so I just literally first campaign I was involved in was trying to save the local library from closing down and I'm sure many people have been affected by the austerity cuts so that was the first campaign and then and just decided to get involved and with the local Green Party at the time for many reasons like one of the reasons being they were the only party that had a red line against austerity they were the only party that stood for free education at the time so a lot of my values and principles really aligned and with the Green Party and it was it was a bit of like a bit of a learning curve because I I don't come. I didn't come from normal tradition and politics background, so I actually was. I remember I would go on YouTube quite a lot, and I'd basically just watch a lot of political videos. I'll read what I can. I'd force myself to watch Daily Politics <laughs> with Joe Coburn and bloody that Andrew Neil block. But it's just just to try and really wrap my head around and things and stuff like that. And and then I was like, right, who makes a local decision? It's the council. And then it, I engaged with the council, and I was like. 
I just couldn't keep on asking the wrong people to do the right thing. So I was just like, right, how can I become a counselor myself? Find out from a counselor, I was like, right, I'm going to stand to become a counselor. <laughs> and then like stood to be a counselor. And I guess with a lot of door knocking and convincing people, um, got elected. Even It was a bit weird way how I got elected because it was an all out election. All the seats were up. So my the two sitting green councillors that war didn't get elected and I didn't. It was very bittersweet, but it was nonetheless, it was uh, it was amazing. And it was like, the way I see a councillor's role is just a glorified community work. And of course, you've got responsibilities within like voting and stuff like that within the council. But you do really get to see the daily shows that people go for. And you're literally seeing outcomes there. And then I guess compared to an MP, whereas I guess you may not see direct results that as quickly as you would if you were a councillor. But yeah, it was a very um, interesting time just to kind of wrap myself. And I guess I'm always learning, to be honest. That, I think that's a great way to go about it. You're always learning. You're always, you know, um, doing community work within whatever role you're in. And talking about um, roles and particularly role modules, um, it must have been incredibly symbolic for you to have had you know, the Lord Mayor of Sheffield Post. Um, and I'd just like for you to talk a little bit about that. Um, not only yeah. were you the youngest ever Lord Mayor of Sheffield, you were the first Somali, first refugee, um, yeah. first Muslim black um, Lord Mayor. So yeah, just yeah. how did you feel? Or maybe you didn't feel like that. Maybe you felt like, yeah. you know, it's a bit too late for these sort of um, yeah. things. Do you know what it is, right? It was just like, it was such a blessing because it was like, it was such a great, for me, the way I saw it, it was like such an amazing opportunity, I guess, to give back to a city that has given me and so many other people so much. And for me, the way I saw my, the role was as a servant, first and foremost, to be honest. And I really wanted everybody in Sheffield to feel as if like this was their role, that it was for them. So like, and I guess I would do a lot of things like different. Like I know there's a lot of, custom and traditions that kind of come within such and like I was, I was 123rd Lord Mayor of Sheffield and it's so steeped in tradition and I remember like I was like like listen we like they're great traditions like we have right to kind of uphold stuff like that but at the same time there's some shit traditions we've had and like traditions come and go but I remember the fact that like for example I, I refused I didn't want a I didn't want a but if I like so if I was married to a woman she'd be the lady mayoress if I was married to a bloke, it'd be the Lord Mayor's consort. If I had a girlfriend at the time, it will be the Lord Mayor's escort. That's like how old like fashion is. But I was like, I didn't want the same person to be with me everywhere because I thought that'd be quite boring. So I would literally just invite different people, whether that be through Twitter or whatever, say, guys, like, who wants to be my consort for the day? And I'd pick them up or whatever. And I'd like, and even like just the whole town hall, like, for example, the full council meeting, there's two roles the Lord Mayor's got so the one of them is chairing the full council meetings where all the it's the main important meeting of the month where all the voting happens the business side chair that meeting and the other side is the other part of the role is I guess it's being the first citizen so I would even like within the full council chamber I'd really just open that up to the public even more where I would I guess because my main two focus areas were young people and, and the creative arts so I would have different local creative creatives come and perform in the council chamber during the council meeting so will that be a comedian a musician a shoemaker whatever just i guess to really emphasize the local decision makers mm -hmm. the amount of wealth of talent that we've got in Sheffield and we need to uh, support it and of course i'd be i'd be lying if i said it was all honky dory and it was all rosy with the councils even within the council itself I, like i would say if i'm being honest they were the biggest um barrier into a lot of the things i want to do and a lot of it was just down to like like power and it was just like it was a bit ridiculous even though like my whole point was with the best of um intentions was just to basically celebrate Sheffield and get people talking about Sheffield in a positive light especially with so many negative things happening in Sheffield recently whether that be and what was in the news you got the whole sadly the Hillsborough disaster you've got like like the tree scandal you've so many things and I just for me I just wanted to be like just be really positive and it was just a bit of a nuisance at times but I feel fortunate I feel privileged it was an amazing and of course at times I 
I was like, am I doing this wrong? Because like, especially when you're in an environment which was not necessarily built for you to have to take these roles on, I was like doubting myself quite a lot. And of course the imposter syndrome is a real thing. And I'd be like, somebody's going to realize I'm a fraud any moments. I guess a lot of my belief came from like, I guess when I decided to be completely unapologetic in myself and I saw the support from young people from the universities, from people from outs, like people in Sheffield and beyond, like supporting me and that for me, I was like, just really kind of really instilled my faith. And I was like, even though they were like, oh, you're breaking tradition, this is and that. And I always say tradition is just peer pressure from dead people. And it's just like, it's not as important as people try and make it out to be basically. I guess a lot of times people are scared of change. That's what mm-hmm. I'm I, I'd like, um, yeah, in, in, the, uh, in the book, you talk a little bit about imposter syndrome and how, you know, you say they're going to catch me out at any moment and realise I'm a fraud. And, um, you know, a lot of people who are, are in certain positions may feel that or, um, you know, people might be getting their first sort of breaks into different industries. Kind of how do you deal with that? Um, you know, not um, given into that negative inner voice. Yeah, I guess like, first of all, it's like we have all been, I guess, socially conditioned to some degree of what a politician is meant to look like, what they're meant to behave like. And so, like, so when someone that doesn't fit into that mold, everyone's a bit like, whoa, like this person doesn't belong here kind of thing. And it's the same, like you said, in a lot of different industries and different and um, like different line of work. And I guess it just kind of comes down to you're there, whether you like it or not, you're in that post, you're in that position. So I get it. Like it can be difficult, especially at the beginning to be like, it takes a lot of vulnerability. If I'm being honest with you to be like, no, I'm going to completely just be myself and read. Cause it's just about showing up and being seen for who you are. And I remember I had like two people come up to me in person and say, listen, Maggie, I disagree with, your stance on what you're doing, what you believe in, but fundamentally, I respect you for being completely yourself. And I and I thought to myself, well, I've got to talk to you if I can just completely be myself and just be content with who I am or try and be somebody else. But still, they're not even going to like me even if I'm trying to be somebody else. So the least I can do is at least be true to myself because that just, at least I'm winning something in that sense. But also the reality of it is it's people are going to have to get used to it. People did get used to it. And it's like, I guess at times it takes one or a couple of people to break down those barriers. So the next people that kind of come take the role are, it's a lot more easier um, for them, shall we say. So it was, of course it was difficult, but um, I guess I just kind of just persevered and I just was like, it is what it is. I'm just gonna, and just keep pushing basically. Mm. What was your um, proudest achievement as Lord Mayor of Sheffield? Wow, so a um, couple of things, like it's really hard to kind of pinpoint for like it's, I guess one of the most like rewarding ones was, um, I was really, I mentored 10 young people and it wasn't even necessarily for politics. It was basically 10 young people that had wanted to become real active citizens in Sheffield, whether that be mainly like community focused or whether that be in their school or whatever it was. And like seeing their development and seeing how far they've come from when um, we actually started the project, that was amazing. Like um, creating a role, talking about traditions, creating a new tradition role of a poet laureate in Sheffield and seeing the reception that I got, that was amazing. And and it's just literally a finishes two year post and we've just appointed another one, that's amazing. Like setting up a UK suicide prevention charter was amazing. Fundraising for like three local amazing charities was amazing, but I guess also, just yeah, honestly, like it's just like yeah, there's loads of things to be proud of and really to be grateful for, and as well, to be honest. So yeah. Um, in 2018, you banned uh, Donald Trump from the city of Sheffield. You declared him a waste man, and it was one of the like most talked about moments of that year. Mm-hmm. Did you man? Did you think um, it would have that effect on people? Like it reached international news. Um, it was kind of like part of your, you know, the way you sort of you, um, sort of dealt with issues and stuff like that. Um, you mm. wanted, like, yeah, just tell me a little bit more. Yeah. About that. You know, I just, I just think of the Maya Angelou quote, which goes, people don't necessarily remember what you say or do, but they remember how you make them feel. 
So I guess in a lot of the things I would do, I'd always try and engage people on an emotional level just to really engage with them. And especially, I guess, at a time where, as well, people's attention spans are getting shorter and there's so much information online. I, I knew, I guess, the, like, I've always been a creative person generally. So, like, I would have this monthly campaign where, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but and I would have a monthly campaign where I would just would squat every month with a, like inside the town hall with a, with a T-shirt with a different political message with a different hat on. And... And it would always be choreographed for a message of some sort. And I, that's how I actually would chair the full council meeting as well. So for the month of July, that campaign was, I guess, while the government was rolling the red carpet out to someone we know is a racist, like homophobe, like me. So in every sense, right? And I just thought, as a city that is so rich, we're celebrating how rich and diverse we are. I just thought, well, let's be quite honest, Alice, right? Was he going to come to Sheffield on his way from Doncaster? He wasn't really going to, but it, it, it was a symbolic point to make the point that yeah. he's not welcome in Sheffield. And I, I said, like, I, the first citizen, I kind of just, like, mimicked him in some sense. And I did call him a waste man. And I think that is the least thing, that's the, like, politest thing you could call Donald Trump is a waste man, to be honest. But I guess I really didn't know the impact it was going to have. Mm -hmm. For me, it was just another monthly campaign that I was doing and I was choreographing. And then the next minute, like, it just things just bit, went a bit wild. And it was like, it's been like, I just remember like the US ambassador, like to the UK was commenting on it. And then like, you had the chief exec of Boeing who've got a plant in Sheffield again. But also, but just to, I just, I just remember seeing like the protests in London, everybody wearing t-shirts and billboards of it around. And I guess it was just such a simple message, but it kind of really resonated with a lot of people. And people's, people say, but imagine like America are our friends, like, why should we not welcome him? And I just feel like yeah, America are, are like they are allies, of course we're not, and they are our friends. But if one of my friends is being an absolute prick and saying absolute crazy thing, I'm gonna say, listen, mate, you're not in, you're not coming inside my house until you get your shit in order, and then you can come to my house. So it's, it wasn't anything personal to the American people whatsoever. But then, of course, it was like July the 14th, Mexico Solidarity Day, because it was like it was like um, it was literally putting children in cage, and I just. I guess just kind of like to, to, to show solidarity. And it was amazing even to see a lot of the businesses in Sheffield to really uh, like come out on that day and to have that mix of solidarity was, was, was amazing. So uh, yeah, it's, I guess it was just, yeah, it's just different ways of campaign. So like in one month I was focused on the old group justice campaign, another month I'd focus on the NHS. And it's like every month I'd like focus on a different topic. Mm -hmm. I am, um... I'd like to talk about your experience um, as working as a MEP and uh, it must have been different, a different kind of experience with a sort of end date in, in mind and you must have also been really busy as well, like writing this book, doing <laughs> all that related to, um, you know, an MEP. So yeah, just talk a little bit about that yeah. whole experience. Definitely. So MEP is member of European Parliament. And it's, if you remember, Alice, we weren't even meant to have the European elections because we'd voted to leave. It was like, yeah, we're leaving. We're not having the European elections. And they were like, things just kept getting delayed. It was like, yep, I guess we're having the European elections. And I guess in some way it kind of came around full circle in the sense of I got politically engaged at the last European election in 2014. And I just remember in last year, 2019, just with the state of the way things were going and I just refused to like accept that the future authors of our country were going to be people like Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson. Mm. Believe that we had a more, such a more hopeful, positive story where we were all the protagonists and played a key role in that. And I just wanted to really put that message up and especially at a time where migrants were basically being scapegoated. Like my entire campaign slogan was immigrants make Britain great and I would wear that slogan the, I, I, do, I went on a tour around Yorkshire and which had one of the highest rates, I think the second highest rates for, to, to leave. But I guess I was unapologetic in my message. I was loudly and proudly campaigning for what I was campaigning on. And then like, thankfully, I guess like to the people of Yorkshire and Humber, they like elected me and that was amazing. But we were originally meant to be there till Halloween. So we knew like, right, unless we get an extension, we're there for Halloween. And it was like 
trying to make the most, especially when you know you've got something for such a limited period of time, you try to make the most of it. And I guess one of the difference between an MEP and a member of parliament in the UK is every member of European parliament is a legislator. You got actual legislation files to work on, right? Whereas unless you're in the cabinet, you really don't get to legislate. So that aspect of it was really exciting to like sit down with legal linguists and you're really like changing and like having to convince the people. Changing the word from would to will is a big kind of and and so like the two areas I'd work on so I was working on the Creative Europe program was a legislative file that I had but we also had and uh, one of the migration and files and the discrimination and um, anti-discrimination files so it was amazing it was like I guess one of the things with European Parliament is just a bit odd place because you do get everyone the full spectrum you look at some neo-fascist member of European Parliament from Greece like called Golden Dawn which are now I think being locked up in Greece but like you get the full spectrum but I guess it was like but one thing that was really interesting was, and like, even though for someone like myself who did campaign for and uh, remain, and like, it's, it seemed like this, like, so for example, I, the European Union is by nowhere like a safe haven of progressive ideas. And I was massively critical of it. And I just remember at the time, like I wrote an um, op-ed piece about it at um, Politico. And it was like being completely found the things that were wrong with the European, European um, Union. And then on one side I had, the pro hardcore remainers, like having saying like having a go at me, and then the other side I had bloody Nigel Farage and the Brexit Party retweeting me saying thank you for seeing like, so it was it's this weird thing that it was like it was it was actually binary. It felt as if like we was at war, like you had to choose what side, and there was there was no room for nuance whatsoever. And it was like guys, like when you want something, like when you love something, you want something to work, you you want it to be the best version of itself that it can be, which means being completely honest with it. And I was completely honest that you needed to fundamentally change. And it was just, yeah, people, yeah, it was just a bit weird. But I guess the way I saw it, basically, Alice, it kind of felt as if like a whirlwind, but it also felt like the Erasmus experience that I never got at university into to some degree. But honestly, it was amazing. Like it's like I had to work with an amazing bunch of people. There's some amazing people out there. And it's like, whatever happens, like the same reasons I was campaigning to remain all those causes are still there, whether that be climate change, whether that be um, fighting poverty, like all those things, they, all these issues that we have, they have no borders, basically. So it's still in our best in interest as a country to have as much of a close relationship with uh, our neighbours as possible, basically. Mm. We've seen um, quite a lot of young people get involved with protesting about climate change, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and... Uh, what would your kind of advice be to young activists, you know, getting involved with these really important issues? Honestly, first and foremost, like, it is just remarkable to see how infused and engaged they are, right? I'm seeing these young people, like, as young as, like, 30, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, going on strike. And I'm like, what the heck was I doing when I, I literally was, like, wagging school, like, sky from school to get up to some sort of nonsense, like, not even, like... So it's just to see how far young people are really engaged. It really does fill me with and a lot of hope. And I just honestly think it's just giving young people, first and foremost, a platform, like giving them the skills and the tools that they that they that they need and kind of keep empowering them because it's they're not even the future, they are they, they are the now more or less. And, mm. and a lot of a lot of young people I kind of like come across that as an advice. A lot of times they just feel like they're not good enough or they see these roles of like counselling and people and they just kind of think, God, you have to have this amount of experience, this, this and that. And it could be further from the truth. Honestly, there are some God awful counsellors and politics. And I'm like, honestly, like, I, I'm not kidding. Like I, like, I know so many 14, 15 year old young people that I'd make better representatives that are doing more effective, like that, like that lead with compassion, that actually speak for people than a lot of politicians or leaders for whatever that matter. So it's like a lot of the things I do is at times whether that be just connecting people with other people, giving people a platform, just like empowering people, whatever it is I can do. And it's like they just honestly like just also like working collaboratively, like it's a real power in like organizing collectively together because there's only so much you can do, so much you can do by yourself when you're a lot stronger working together. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about your experience writing the book. Um, kind of, how long did it take you to write The Art of Disruption? What was working with the publishers like? Just you know what? I'm already getting triggered, Alice. I'm just. 
I'm being honest. Like, so do you know what, right? So I had a book deal back in like May. And then like, I wasn't, before I was an MEP, like, and then I was like, shit, I guess I'm going to Brussels. And then, and then like, again, you know what, when, when you know you've got someone for a limit of time, you want to make the most of the opportunity. So I was like, yeah, I'll just kept, I just kept pushing, I pushed it. And they were like, right, the final, final deadline, February, end of February. And I'd written, I guess I'd written like, of course, the book proposal. And I knew what I was going to talk about in each chapter. But it just meant still writing. So when Brexit fully happened on the 31st of January, I wrote like 70% of the book in the month of February. I literally just locked myself in my apartment. And I just, what was I like? I remember I was having a lot of Arizona iced tea and um, a lot of kind of like pear drops. It was just weird. But yeah, I just like just late nights and I just got it done. And I was, because it was meant to come out in, it was meant to come out in May because <laughs> I had this like really cool national book tour plan. Like, yeah, only else people that had plans, but you got cancelled, so we pushed it September. But the thing was, it's um, like it's the like I've written, of course, for like op eds for different outlets and stuff, but I've never written a book before. Like, the most I've ever written in one piece was like 2000, sorry, 3000 word essay on planktons and rivers and something like that, like something to do with aquatic zoology. So it was a like it, it was like also I'll be honest with you, it was, it was it, I had to be a bit vulnerable, which I always find a bit hard at times, and I, it was just a bit of like, oh my god, did you really want to say this? Like, do you really? But I guess I had to be honest with myself, and I also saw the book as, I guess, some like because the book will outlast me when I'm dead, like hopefully. But it was like I guess it was one way I can really get my thoughts out, the lessons that I've learned, and anything that I just want to share with people. I just thought. Mm could basically be and just to like briefly tell you how it kind of came about the kind of commandments and manifesto points it was based in a, a, a music festival in Sheffield called Tramlines and they asked me imagine they're like if you can have a billboard we'll give you a billboard you can have whatever you want on it what would you put on it and I was like I don't know and I just remember I was the 10th anniversary of the festival so I put something around 10 I was like right chef if there was Sheffield's 10 commandments what would it be and that's how I kind of came up with, even though they're not exclusive to Sheffield they're quite universal but then I guess when I really deeped it, it was like, they literally are like manifesto points in themselves and I kind of like big themes. And then I kind of just use the backbone that kind of worked really, really well. Is, um, are, you, are you gonna, is there a plan to write more books or are you just yeah. taking a break from writing at the moment or? No, no, like, I've all, uh, you know, like, I'm, th I'm looking at, cause I've always got different ideas. So there's like a couple of options I'm just basically weighing up at the moment. and. I need to like just yeah so I'm just basically yeah I'm definitely there's gonna be more writing 100 percent and so it's uh, just trying to figure out because I'm, I'm, there's three ideas that I've got I just need to like figure out which one and then kind of um, get on with it basically um what's your favorite commandment or is there one that you turn to most um from the book um do you know in terms of like the current, um, at the moment, because I don't get to see my mum as often as I'd like, and I guess because she's in the high risk category and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it changed every week. So I'd, I'd probably say like, tell your mom you love her. But it's like, I've never kissed a Tory knowingly anyway, should we say, but it's like, that's like, couldn't be more relevant today than it's been with everything that's been happening ahead with the government at the moment. And then like, and I know it's such a cliche thing to say, be kind, but honestly, like it's so, it costs nothing, Alice, and it makes such a profound impact on and you and people that you don't even know, that you sometimes you'll just never know what it could mean to like, and I tell a really like a, a story that happened to me, but like um, came across just by the power of basic, just being kind to people that you just have absolutely no idea what they're going for and stuff like that. And it just goes a long way. So yeah. And, um, that basically, I don't think anybody will be getting any rounds in anytime soon. <laughs> no, not, not yeah. here, not in uh, Liverpool. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a huge amount of political unrest. You know, you've been talking about it in this conversation to do with COVID, Brexit, international issues as well. Um, you know, at sometimes it can be quite overwhelming. Um, what do you do to sort of 
maintain these issues on a local grassroots attainable level mm. so like one of the th like it's um so when i because i moved back to sheffield literally just before the lockdown in like second week of march and i wanted to like because i was still like and i'm still working on some european projects and stuff but for me it was important to remain grounded in my community so i became a trustee of um Sheffield and City of Sanctuary. So we do a lot of work with them. I've been volunteering, especially during the first round of lockdowns, like many people were. And honestly, like it's even just like checking up on my neighbors, like it's, I guess that's how I try and cope with things at times. I guess it's probably just checking on other people and stuff like. But on a personal level, like it's things have been such a whirlwind, it kind of really forced me to stop and just. I don't know, and it like, I guess just to even like reflect, I've not really had much time to reflect things were moving so quickly. So at times it was hard, at times it was like really welcome and stuff like that. But it's, um, for me, it's just keeping grounded and like making sure like my family, making sure my community and I'm connected, I'm kind of just doing whatever I can. That really kind of helps me stay grounded, but also really reminds me of what matters at the end of the day. And um, also just like how, effective we can be when we kind of come together and it's just nice like at times like at times of like really when people are struggling and are in despair it just kind of helps to lean on each other and kind of look out for one another mm. um so we're a creative writing organization what writers are you influenced by if there are any or is it more music or wow okay um i've not been asked that question so and uh, I guess the writers like, um, like I got a couple of confessions, right? So I don't like, I always have to keep telling myself, Majid, buying books and reading books are two different hobbies, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got a lot of books. That I've not, the last book I read was, um, so you know, one of those books you keep going to the bookstore and it's like, it just catches your eye and then you, th you still think about it like months down the line. And it was a book called Convenient Store Woman. And it's basically about a Japanese woman that works in a convenience store. <laughs> but it was like an international bestseller. It was just amazingly written, really great. But um, I don't know, like, uh, and I've not read any of the classics. I don't really, like, um, know books. I, I, like, I'm, yeah, I don't know any specific writers. But I guess music's always been um, um, a thing, like, I guess I was kind of listening to. Like, I've not got into the whole, the whole podcast thing, really. But um, yeah, writing is difficult. It's hard. <laughs> like, really. But um, yeah. yeah. What about music? What about music? What kind of music influences you? Or okay, so like because I'm not, um, I'm completely honest. I've got my Spotify. I'll tell you my most listened track of this week. Right, <laughs> is a you might not know. So is a um, Musician called Master KG called Jerusalem. It's a really great song. It's got the beat to it. I love a bit of Aretha Frank Franklin. I love a bit of um, um, who have I got here like Turley Richards. Um, mainly, like be honest with you, I just like drew up a lot of um, a lot of soul. I've been to a lot of soul. Just kind of like uplifting, feel good, and um, kind of songs. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm into at the moment, basically. Um, we've had a comment in. Um, I This is from Judy. I really enjoyed the inspiring piece from your book, but what you did to Trump beats even that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah I it's like, it's, it's um, do you know what's interesting? Because, you know, there's one thing about leadership in the sense of like, Honestly, I just one of the things I just didn't, I kind of I realized where well, people just want somebody, I would kind of appreciate somebody who is like is just authentic, like authentic, but also just really like says what is like if somebody's bloody terrible and doing terrible things, like call it out for what is and not sitting on the fence. And a lot of times, what I see a lot of politicians like who don't want to rock the boat, and the amount of times like Alice, I would get told. Oh, do you know what, Madge? Maybe you know you should kind of calm down, or like maybe you should like tone it down and not be too political, or you shouldn't speak on that. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I haven't got the privilege of 
not being too political. Like I'm, I'm a black Muslim refugee. So much injustice happening to my family, even if it's not me, like I'm just happening over, how can I keep quiet? Especially even when, like when I've been fortunate enough to have a platform and to kind of remain quiet, it just seems like, and plus as well, as everything you do is political, remaining to stay silent is just basically siding with basically the status quo and thinking like it's still a political decision. So for me, it was like any given opportunity I'd always, even though like I would get racist abuse, I don't, I'm quite thick skinned, thankfully. And it's, I just would just roll with the punch or whatever. But it was like, I really didn't let that deter me, even if it meant calling Donald Trump a waste man and kind of banning him from Sheffield. It was like, I guess I, and at a time where people just are, I'm just, I'm just scared that they may piss somebody off or whatever and that it kind of stops them from doing the right thing like it's just do the right thing basically mm -hmm. um we've just got a question here loving the conversation and hearing your story Majid um what advice would you give to your younger self <laughs> I'd probably tell myself off like what would I tell advice to uh, myself I'd honestly be like read I don't know like okay I probably I tell myself to read more books <laughs> I honestly I'd be like your life would be a lot easier so just read a bit more books but like just because and adult age I've really just really started just to like get into reading books I'll be quite frank with and it's my sister that really influenced me into and I just remember thinking to myself I'm like how can a bunch of words like how can my sister have so much enjoyment out some <laughs> words in a book and I just was a bit baffled by it and then I was like started getting into it and I was just like wow like like it just like it's so like I'd probably say remember but I'd also probably say listen like it's calm down like stop stressing like it's just like things will things will be okay um but yeah that's probably what I'd say um what what are you working on now what's next for um your political work activist work yeah, so I'm doing a couple of things at the moment. So for work-wise, I'm doing um, two things. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm working um, on a climate justice um, project, um, pan-European pro climate justice project. So I'm basically working with a lot of um, groups um, across Europe and organisations and activists in creating a network, but also making sure that, I guess, the policies that, um, are in, that kind of get proposed from that the European Union are basically, um, that they just and they're basically not leaving out the voices of those marginalized communities who are the most affected by it because there's a clear link between race and climate you can't yeah. talk about the other basically and so it's um especially yeah, like it's the people who are disproportionately affected are black and brown marginalized working class people and yet a lot of the time all of the time a lot of their voices aren't heard during the whole kind of climate um debate so i'm doing some climate work, but i'm also and uh, there's an arts university in Amsterdam called University of the Underground, which I'm running a six month program called New Politics and Afrofuturism with lots of other amazing tutors. So basically just been um, creating that program and kind of seeing that. So that's been going good fun. But I'm also like still involved in uh, Sheffield and mm. lots of other kind of bits and bobs um, along the way. I, I can never like not be busy. <laughs> Basically, like I don't think I don't think I've ever been bored. I know that sounds stupid, but like there's always things I need to do. But it's like I guess, yeah, I, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm I'm grateful. I'm happy. Things are all good. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, I've got a question here. If you were prime minister for the day, what one thing would you change, or what law? What one law would you? That is unfair, Alice. I'm just gonna get <laughs> one thing like. Like, there's one thing I can do. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. If there's one thing I could do. Um, oh, tough one. It would literally... One thing I could do. Um, oh, wow. Tough one. It would literally be... Um, it'd be something educational. Because you'd think if there's one thing you'd want to change the fabric, that with one with that one action, you'd, you'd want to do... do you'd, have, you'd want it to have such... A, big impact that it changed the fabric of the country or changed the way things have been done. so there's something education related so whether that be making because you know that is if you go to all the private schools right they get taught rhetoric they get taught about how to campaign politics because they're expected to be the next leaders of the world of the country right yeah. whereas if like if 
maybe if we were to get rid of private schools, but also make campaigning and politics like part of the school curriculum, like people, young people would be engaged from a very young age. And therefore going to like they'll be able to sift through all the bullshit that they get through the media and stuff like that. But also they'll be more engaged and they, they'll be more active citizens. And because the reality is that we are the majority, like it's like it's, if we look at um, like the government cabinet, for example, it's like, it, it frustrates me because the people that we elect to choose as leaders don't reflect the people that they, they, they represent. So if you look at the government cabinet, you can, you can say the same for local, from the local authority as well. It's the majority from the same class background, most of the millionaires. How on earth are they bloody meant to understand what child poverty is? Like, mm -hmm. like how are they meant to understand like the devastating effects of austerity? Like it's, they're also constantly like attacking the arts as well. They don't value the arts and I'm not surprised because like art, for me anyway, like arts and arts and culture, it really engenders empathy and it's really difficult to like be an empathetic person and vote conservative. So it's in their interest to basically privatize it. But it's like, it's, it's yeah, it's just something education related and just to be able to really galvanize the nice and just basically, yeah. That's um, an absolutely fantastic answer. Sorry, I was a bit mean. Um, but I think I'm going to wrap up um, this incredible conversation. So thank you, Majid, for um, joining us tonight. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Alice, for, making, for being a great host and everyone at um, Writings on the Wall Festival. And I know you guys have been doing an amazing job um, for our Black History Month. So thank you for all you guys have been doing. Um, as always, there is a monitoring form in the comments, if you could please fill that out. It helps us with our funding and putting more events on like this. If you'd like to buy a copy of the book, we recommend buying from independent bookstores, um, like our friends from News From Nowhere. Um, we still have our last few events on um, as part of our Black History Month festival. So please check out uh, wowfest.uk for more information. And um, a huge thank you to our funders, Arts Council England, Liverpool City Council and Lord Mayor's Fund. Um, we're part of a wider program um, with creative organizations of Liverpool. Um, thank you for joining us and um, have a wonderful rest of the evening. <laughs>